actions it has taken. Um, we never had a proper structure for this, which is probably great, probably as it should be. Um, and I was worried that, I would, that we would suffer what often happens in day-long workshops. The end just tails off and everybody's half asleep and they're bored. I don't think that's happening here. There's far too much to say, which is a real accolade for all the speakers who've been doing tremendously right through the day. I, um, I imagined somehow we'd have a rethinking of consumption and production and political economy, maybe a little bit of STS and some Malthusianism. I didn't see any of that. <laughs> this is new terrain for me, which is, I think, probably quite a good thing. Um, in fact, I'm sure it's a very good thing. So, what's happened is, is really quite imaginative. Um, it's brought together a collective idea of stuff. What I think we have to do at the end I don't know quite how best to structure this. Uh, I asked Andrew to help me chair so he could immediately come in and um, tell me if I've got it wrong. But I think there are two things that need to come out of this conference. One is material, one is not material. The material is, it would be nice to have some form of stuff that people can look at. And the suggestion is that this might take two forms. One is, you'll have noticed that Cole at the back there has been taking a wonderful video of all of this. And perhaps if no one has objections, that video might go up online uh, before very long on, on, on our website. So that's one bit of the material. A second bit of the material, I'm open to brainstorming. What we thought of beforehand was that we might try to get a special issue of the journal together. Um, that there are a number of journals that might be suitable. So that's the material parts, and there are all sorts of things that go into that. The immaterial might be more important, which is how to continue the conversation. So we've had some very provocative suggestions from pretty much all of our speakers, particularly some who've, who've done really yeoman work, if I can use that. Um, bringing forward interesting ideas. Um, so the second thing is how, how we, what networks we might create, what, which can be very simple, how to keep this conversation. I'm really pleased that we've got significant groups of people from Berkeley and Davis, no doubt from elsewhere as well. But I think trying to keep that conversation going is, um, is a useful thing to do. So, I was proposing a format like this, but I don't know if it works, that we open it up for brainstorming, and then we ask our panel uh, to summarize at the end. Is and that and brainstorming around ideas about what next? Yeah, brainstorming ideas of what next. What, well, what you found really helpful, thought-provoking, and where we might take it from here. Given that we're not a huge group, but it's a significant representation from a whole bunch of thoughtful, um, uh, thoughtful institutions, or whatever we might call them. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Edited journal numbers. I'm could be great, could be long and slow and painful. Uh, so um, I, I was actually trying to think of other ways in which we could refer to an event like this, which would be quicker, faster, and in some ways more efficacious. Uh, one of them would we could just invent any statement we like that came out of this event and then cite it and claim that it came from this. So inventing authorship in order to demonstrate that it was really, really, really happening. Uh, and you know, I'm not entirely joking. Um, you can invent past as well as futures. And, and I'm actually ambivalent about edited journal numbers just because I've been through one and it was 
long and painful. Uh, but I'm happy to be corrected on that one as on anything. Um, so actually, I'd just like to throw it over to what other people think would be fun and interesting. Did we get real climate change in the little people? possibility would be, uh, I agree with Andrew again, that um, the production of a, 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 a journal issue, or indeed even worse, of a book, um, is a long process which delays the impact and takes us all away from doing useful things. So one thing might be to just have a set of working papers online, which can be done very quickly. And then, uh, uh, I don't know, well that would be a starting point, I don't know what else, but yeah. The difficulty, one difficulty of that is that the academic evaluation system does not that currently gives much more weight to published journal articles than to online working papers. We could invent the peer review, it's true. We could peer review them. Um, they could also work their way into publication. Yeah, and, and they could work their way. I, I think uh, following on that, I think that especially for you know junior faculty who have to get articles published to get to stay alive, go to keep a roof over your head. Fundamental point for peasant farmers and academics. Okay. So, so, um, but maybe uh, preliminary working papers, which are not the full-fledged academic article, but which gesture towards what the academic article will one day be, uh, would be a quicker, sweeter, and um, more entertaining way to have all this up soon, not, not long. Well, it's very easy to put things on the. Um, uh, California Digital Library, which e-scholarship is, is, is one part. So we could we, that, that's a good idea. I think that's a great idea. Yes. I was curious whether this was going to be a annual type situation, and if so, <laughs> not to put any uh, onus on you, but if so, if those papers could be attached in some sort of an annual review or an annual Yes. Follow on with that. Um, we're all from uh, Berkeley, from the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department, and want to take this opportunity to invite everyone to a spring symposium we're organizing on SPS and development, where we hope to discuss many of the themes that were raised 
um, today, and so we, you know, we we could see this as a sort of um, a Bay Area um, effort this year because there's also Sawyer seminar going on at Davis. Um, actually, Stanford is also going to do a postcolonial and STS um, symposium in the spring. So seems to be a good year to be thinking about these issues in the Bay Area, and um, and that's another way of keeping this conversation going. April 5th and 6th, we have dates now. <laughs> we'll send you more information. When is it going to be? April 5th and 6th. OK, very good. That's very good. Yeah. I think that suggests uh, 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 um, a, very, a, a potentially fruitful collaboration amongst the universities, and particularly graduate students. Uh, I'm impressed, I don't know very much about this example, but I'm really impressed by the way that two sociologists battled in Berkeley many years ago around class. And those two sociologists, Eric Olin Wright and uh, Burrowani, uh, have been successively presidents of the uh, uh, American Sociological Association. And the journal in which they publish, the graduate journal, continues to publish good stuff. Um, so I think a collaboration amongst those four or five universities around development, STS, rethinking issues, um, and creating a, a common a, a conversation with occasional workshops, which we or make an attempt to attend. I think that's a brilliant way to figure out. Michael. Um, I, I think these are all great ideas. I for one would like a peer review journal article, but of course that does take a long time. But I, I also like the idea of having some type of uh, workshop, a conference uh, document. I was looking at uh, what the University of Copenhagen did in terms of their climate. They had a workshop titled Science Deadens Me Climate Change. And they did a workshop, a 20-page uh, workshop report where they had you know, some of the key players like Sheila Jasanoff, uh, Alan Erwin, Brian Wing, all speaking about different issues of, that the social sciences and STS brings into climate change. And, it, and in these 20 pages, they have the overall framework of the, the workshop and then about a page per speaker of what they presented and what they bring to the issue of climate change. So I think that could be another um, great opportunity. And I can uh, send that to you guys for you guys can see. I think it's possible. That's a great idea. How can someone get the support and credit for the work of pulling something like that together? If there's um, a way, that would, I think that's, that's the most uh, realistic and interesting idea. I mean, I, I like the collaboration. I think there's a lot of possibilities. But to get down to earth, I think, yeah, what you're saying really makes sense, but that's a big chunk of work. Yeah, 20 pages, they have two editors. And then uh, every speaker got about a page uh, on the presentation. Yeah. Uh, key highlights. Yeah. Uh, just um, so you would like to think about the idea you of know, taking whatever outcomes outcome we have here beyond the, like, the academic community, and I don't know, trying to touch you know, with either agencies, the company agencies, and just some places that we might be connected to, or even to organizations and, and have it not, you know, maybe in a different language or something. Because ultimately, it's, this was an amazing critique of most of the stuff that is happening and that we are doing. So I think that would be like an important tool maybe just to, you know, deliver in a way that is not necessarily academic. And I don't know if that seems important to you or... Well, that's a question. Amongst the graduate students here, particularly, are there volunteers who would, uh, I like Kathy's idea, volunteers who might be willing to put together, brilliant, Jenny, anybody else? Michael, wow, you two, I think, have just been nominated as editors of this uh, piece of work.
maybe something that you could each focus on and bring your own concept to would be maybe. Yeah. Um, I have a second suggestion or a question that kind of has come out of the box today um, and maybe could be a way to frame like a, a website or whatever, but it's, it's asking the question about like, you know, what's new about climate change or, or how, is climate change anything new and how we talk about development? Um, and also thinking, you know, not just maybe in terms of like, like how is it new for, you know, how we do development interventions, but also how is it new for, you know, the way society, like the way groups of people are organizing themselves and what, what are maybe some new like, you know, uh, ecological sort of struggles that people are, are you know, farmers or something like that have to deal with too. Um, but like what's new about climate change? Or is, does this bring anything new to the, the table for development? Um. It seemed to me that the constituency that is present and the constituency that this is most useful for um, is not so much people who haven't noticed that there's climate change happening, but people who feel paralyzed by despair about climate change, um, paralyzed by not not just the you know the, the reaction to the to the, the so-called deniers, um, but also by the, the stalemate and worse than stalemate of global policies that are making things worse by letting people off the hook through you know buying your way through carbon credits and so on. And, and to me, the, the the strongest theme that came out of the uh, conversations is even then, even when people were talking about specifically climate change activities like the city plans, the Oakland work, um, or when people were criticizing, uh, we're talking climate skepticism, uh, the strongest the uniting theme seemed to me that the best way to cope for, for climate change, whether you believe in it or not, you know, the best way to cope for it, just in case it's there, is to uh, start from people's survival, people's activities, people's interests, uh, social justice. Uh, and, and that was, you know, I think that ran through the themes that rejected climate change as a framework and, the, and then the presentations in the morning that started with climate change as a framework. And to me, I, I found it really empowering. I wasn't expecting to be very interested in the morning talks because I thought, oh, well, it's just going to be the same, you know, a bunch of policy bullshit where people are just making these vague promises. But it seemed like people are really rooted in, I mean, the Oakland example, the Santa Cruz example, really rooted in uh, local needs. And I know, we know that's happening in other parts of the world. So I'd like to see some way of kind of raising that idea. People agree that you know, we have a sort of a consensus about that. Uh, I'd like to see some way of making that the prominent headline of you know, the, the abstract or something, uh, the title. Of, oh, and it fits with, with um, the idea of rethinking climate change in the context of development. Can we respond to this question? I, I think for me it may not be, the question may not be, you know, what's new about climate change, but what is, what is new about the context in which climate change is an issue? And I think that is really, this is what Jeff talked about, we're going to know analog futures. We are in a moment, and I believe this, I don't, maybe I dropped the Kool-Aid or <laughs> bought the imaginary, but I think I do think we are at a different point in history than we have been in the past. And we, cannot, we can't judge climate change as we've judged or critiqued or evaluated other international agendas that have come to roost on you know, particular places in particular um, historical moments. We are at a different moment in time. We're at a different moment where states have different roles, uh, private agencies, private actors have different roles, civil society has a different role to play. And, that, to me, is where a lot of what we were talking about today was really interesting in terms of how this is all coming to play today, now, as we move forward about this issue. And so, again, it's, I guess it's shifting the lens, not you know, a little bit away from climate change and saying, yes, we have this, this is the issue of the moment, this is the issue of the day, but it's the day that's quite different. We are in a very different moment in history today than we were even, I would argue, even 10 years ago. And, and particularly in the area, and I'm sure Kathy agrees, in terms of food systems, we're in a very different moment And thinking about land use, whether it's an issue of scarcity or how we're framing it, the implications are very real for people who are needing, having to meet basic needs. And so I think 
that to me is where there's a lot of fruitful conversation to, to take place. Yeah, I'd just like to hear, and I apologize for not being able to attend the whole thing because it's like a wonderful conference. I hope that we can continue the conversation. I'd like to uh, hear any comments on the possibility of an edited volume, if that would be appealing to this group at all, as opposed to a special issue. Not to me, I think there are too many books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless the edited volume is an ebook which allows people to buy individual chapters, I think nobody buys right. them. And, and so once, once the publishers did that, the whole question of edited volumes might turn out to be much better than a special journal number, but that's not quite there yet. They are doing it more, more I, I, I should say, I'm the, city, I'm the new series editor of a, <laughs> of a, a book, and we, we have kind of free reign on multiple mm -hmm. volumes. That concern the imagination and the SCS themes would be quite appropriate. But it's for real hay market, which is a kind of verso um, competition, you might say. That's the right word. Yeah. Um, and I could see, I mean, this I think would be a wonderful starting point for one of those volumes. I can see it. And, and I definitely have an interest in being able to um, download them chapter by chapter. So. I wouldn't be the editor of that book. Sorry? <laughs> I would not be the editor of that book. That's someone else would have <laughs> It sounds like there would have to be some back pages and tabulation if you, anyone would like to take something like that on. Which, uh, I didn't see anyone throwing themselves into the pit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the, well, well, I'm not certainly not ruling that out. I think it's great. but. Um, I like the idea of a short, quick statement. We can put up working papers, but if you two would be willing to help collate and edit something that was short and got out in a month or two, rather than a year or two, and had some uh, snappy title, not so, uh, I think, Kathy's getting getting towards something uh, and recognizing the diversity of views as well as some common interests. Does that sound possible? Uh, I, uh, I, uh, as a, well, all of us are busy. All of us are busy, I know. And I certainly have great difficulty in getting articles finished. Um, so a one-page article sounds to me like um that's really hard to write <laughs> it's like a lot of top of it. hell it's with cool. hell with a feather bed it's much cooler, something like that <laughs> for me it's easier a four or five page article is a lot easier to write than a one page article <laughs> or three page maybe i can do it in three pages i mean one one option might be if several people here who have comments that they've you know either in the panels Together, I mean, there's lots of spaces for academic editorials that are, this would be drawing on diverse research, but you're really making a, a statement. The kind of comments that we've heard were much more editorial than research, you know, presentations. And so, and there are, you know, the, I, I'm an editor board of Climate and Development, which is a journal that might be interested, or, you know, Regional Environmental Change, Global Environmental Change. I mean, these are places where editorial statements, they're not, I mean, they different journals have different rules about who, who does this, but it might be a way that similar statements could find their way through relatively quickly into, into a public space. While we're thinking about that, let me give another plug of thanks and say thanks to Lisa Nishioka, who's not here, but who's the administrator of the Center for International and Regional Studies, who made, uh, did a lot of the legwork helping get it, getting this conference going. So, and also thank you to all of you. I don't want to make this into a final statement. Don't, don't go, don't go. <laughs> Keep listening, as uh, NPR often says. 
Um, thank you to all of you uh, for coming along. I think we've had, it's actually quite a good size of group. Um, and we've had high levels of participation. I appreciate, I appreciate that a lot. Um, so, are there... Is the idea of collaboration between the universities, the Bay Area universities, in some sort of topic like this? Uh, I've forgotten your name, sorry. Javier. Javier. So your idea, I think that's a good idea, that we set up uh, uh, some sort of listserv or email list or web page uh, that tries to bring those four or five universities together around this topic, around a topic related to this, STS development uh, change. Okay, so we've, we've made a little progress there. I think that's a really nice idea. Um, yes? Uh, it could be on the website sort of thing where it's like theme, and then various like conferences and stuff or work, workshops that come up, there's a link to each one. Yes. And then you go to the link and then you can see the you know papers or whatever, the, the shortened papers for each conference, um, or a little description of each conference or something like that. Yeah, that'd be great. Who, um, how are we going to do this? Who, uh, which people within the groups are willing to volunteer? Costanza, great, I was hoping you would. <laughs> Wonderful, can we have a volunteer from David? We have a big hand for Costanza. Sorry? Don't forget about the state school, so I have graduate students that would be interested. Yeah. Brilliant. You I mean you can twist their arms. No, I have graduate students, I just didn't tell them about it because I didn't know how good it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I just came back from another conference, it wasn't on the front of my radar screen, but there are a few people. Uh, I can ask one then. I think that would be very good. Then we're up to seven or eight Bay Area universities. That's great. Yeah. Can we include Arizona in this? Oh, sure. I don't know who I'll volunteer, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to find someone. I think that's a very good way of continuing the conversation through various means, including occasional workshops. That's great. Are there issues that people are dying to talk about? We've got about, well, we've got about five and a half hours, according to that part. <laughs> <laughs> Realistic. Realistically, a few minutes. Um, yes? So, um, the, the notion of efficiency has come up a lot, and it's, I think it's fair to say that probably a lot of them realize you know, it's ties to um, economics and the values that are associated with it, and reducing everything to efficiency measures. And, um, I was at a conference actually with the Suns also, where there's a, a green chemist um, who made a big keynote speech, and it was very interesting because he brought up this, um, this sort of new questioning of measures of efficiency and how to think about and even whether to think about efficiency, at least in the realm of green chemistry, and, and trying to make this sort of sea change in how chemists work and thinking about the broader impacts of their work. And um, it, 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 it intersects a lot in, in my work. It's, it's one of the strongest arguments for winners and losers between different models of how to work with various materials or intervene in you know, the environment or whatnot. And so I'm wondering, I mean, given that, that there, there is this person in a field that I would not expect to question even following something that was efficient and choosing something else that was absolutely inefficient based on another set of criteria, do you see a, uh, any possibility that we might move away from this very entrenched cultural um, notion of efficiency equals good or right, or the best, best practices, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, is there an actual opportunity to, to trouble that in any real, real way, not just as academics talking to each other? 
Could you just clarify your, your question? Are, we, are you thinking mainly in terms of criteria of uh, biophysical efficiency and choices of what kind of thing to research, or are you, the people that you're aware of doing this work thinking mainly in terms of the economic efficiency of the, you know, the resulting product? So, well, so um, you know, with the, with the different ways of measuring um, efficiency in, in chemistry, there might be you know, atom efficiency, or there might be efficiency of the input materials, and that relates mm -hmm. to economics and all that. And with the work that I, I, I'm doing, which is on electronic waste recycling, there's lots of different types of efficiency measures that people are doing, you know, getting to you know, resource scarcity issues, but also economic efficiency, time efficiency, and all of these things come in conflict, obviously, right, with, um, with a lot of other socio-political issues related to these commodity chains. So it's kind of all of that wrapped up together. Because I'm thinking that there's, um, there's uh, plenty of useful things to do with thinking about biophysical efficiencies and choices of, but uh, there's also uh, ideas of, I mean, what's the product? What's the, what's the goal? And when, when, you really, when you look at the fundamentals of mainstream economics, the, the whole purpose of the whole operation is to produce the mo most possible stuff, or the most goods and services, you can put services in that too, to produce the maximum amount of goods and services at the least possible cost. So more stuff, more stuff, it's all about stuff. Um, and then, <clears throat> but criteria of, if your goal is happiness, if your goal is social well-being, if your goal is human survival, if your goal is pretty and productive rural landscape, then there are all kinds of other ideas of, uh, you, I mean, you can, frame them as efficiency, but of you know, all other kinds of goals, social goals, that if you want to frame it in terms of efficiency, you can, you, you can bring that in. But the narrow economic definition of efficiency is the, the one that is most problematic. And I think that the biophysical definitions of energy efficiency it really depends on the, the social and political context. But I don't know, maybe other people have more insight on this, but that's just my first thought. Andrew? Um. I'm actually skeptical that neoliberalism and markets are as powerful as they say they are. I think it's a kind of rhetorical demonstration of numerical authority, which is already peaked and is going somewhere else. Oh. We need to follow it empirically. Uh, so, the United States is particularly given to cost-benefit analysis because of a contentious political culture. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of... Uh, uh, numbers are things you apply to, the, to, to decisions you've made for other reasons entirely often in public arenas. So, so um, they have a kind of, they, they, numbers are attached to fiction and stories, and that's fine, but, um, but it's just how they work. So I think efficiency has peaked for now as a way of motivating politics, partly because efficiency all along was about how to demonstrate credible authority by the state before its publics, and I think it's dawning upon government officials that numbers are not cutting it in the way that they thought it would. On the other hand, we have No Child Left Behind, which was the most kind of stupid number that we've ever seen, so it has some way to run. <laughs> Let's take that as uh, um, the first statement of closing statements. Is that all right? <laughs> Ashwini, closing statement in about mm, two and a half sentences. <laughs> what are the best things that no, what are the best things that came out of this? We need to pay more attention to what is happening rather than what people are saying is happening, and we are not paying enough attention to that and to make that distinction. And I also follow Andrew in uh, believing that uh, we have tended to believe neoliberalism to be more powerful than it has actually turned out to be. And uh, maybe I'm biased because I come from India where, well, a lot of people can get their way. And, no matter how much the central government, the state, beats its chest about efficiency, they don't get to make decisions based on efficiency because there are other constituencies that force the government to pay attention to other criteria. And uh, if it doesn't happen in the US, then we need to pay attention to what might be going on here that it doesn't work, instead of assuming that this is how it works everywhere. And he's an economist first. I am trained to come. <laughs> well, I already pretty much said what I thought was good about the conference, but I'll, t I'll just add one more one thing. A lot of times when I talk about these uh, alternatives and resistances and 
and things that are, are, are really happening. My students accuse me of being idealistic and impractical. And they say, but then we live in this material culture and everybody's just chasing the next gadget or fashion and, um, and everybody's out for their own self-interest and we're all competing. And then I ask them to sort of meditate for five minutes on different decisions that they've made and that their fellow students have made and their family and their community have made and what actually motivated those decisions. And darn if they don't realize that most of the activities uh, choices that people have made around them, long term and short term, actually have other motivations than acquisition, competition, et cetera. And um, yeah, so, and then I, I tell them again, I'm the one who's being realistic and practical because I'm looking at what you just said, what is actually happening and not this imaginary of uh, the neoliberal imaginary of competition and dog eat dog and consumption, Uber Alice. Um, well, it's hard to follow up. I think you guys have covered, but I think, um, yeah, so I mean, I think part of the issues that to me were particularly salient today was, you know, thinking about the distinguishing this kind of development with the big D, you know, that we might kind of, I think is for me a kind of an imaginary in some sense. I mean, I, I maybe this is my bias from working mainly in Mexico, which has a lot of sovereignty and is a very strong, Kind of national identity in which I feel like, you know, what we're really talking about is kind of little b of, of lots of action taking place in different ways, and we really need to understand those linkages. I think that's where the real interest is: is how does how is power constructed? Who has a voice? How are these these narratives that take place in particular contexts to construct, you know, a pathway forward? How who's participating in those, and how are they participating? And I think we're finding. It's really diverse depending on where you are. And, but if we as academics can begin to understand that, perhaps there we have a contribution to make in terms of thinking about which ways and uh, our, our constructive ways forward. Okay, I want to take the chair's statement of the chair's position to not summarize. Because <laughs> okay. I think everybody else has done it rather well. Um, I want to say. Thank you to lots of people, to all of you for coming, and to say that we will, the group, the various groups, will think about different options for the material and the non-material, but it sounds as though we've got a number of sensible possibilities. Um, but don't hesitate to um, collaborate and hassle, and try and make sure that you get what you think uh, should come out of this this workshop. Um, and I should also say, several of us will be going to dinner later on. If any of you want to join in, that would be great. All right, thank you all. Thank you.